Sister Shivaniji, most uh, welcome to London and to the festival of Bharat. Um, we have a very vibrant uh, Hindu Indian community here and although we are known for our contribution in the economic space, in the financial space and in the medical space, what we are not so acknowledged for is our presence and contribution that we have to make in the religious space. So in this country now we are beginning to find a way of articulating what it is that we have been graced with and what our ancients and our spiritual practitioners are doing. So this is a wonderful opportunity for us and we're absolutely delighted to have you here with the Festival of Bharat in London. Thank you so much for, for joining oh, us. Thank you so much. So I was given the task of um, considering a conversation that we could have and to explore um, some of the ideas and also some of the experiences that you have obviously encountered. And what we'd like to do is place it in the context of a resurgent India. India is beginning to recover its own identity. And as all practitioners know, when you are encountering the wrinkles in your identity, it can be a bit of a turbulent journey. So as a world traveler, as a person engaging with practitioners all over the world, here in London, I'm going to try and tease out from you some of the, the nuggets and gems that you've accumulated on your journey. We have always known that one day Bharat will be a, a Jagat Guru, a Vishva Guru. This is the teaching that we all grow up with. It's almost like the second sound that you hear when, when, when you open your eyes here. Firstly, it'll be Om and a Gayatri Mantra, and then it'll be Bharat will be a Jagat Guru. So we've always had it in the background. Do you feel that that's going to be a reality soon? Are we going to see that, or is that a, a pipe dream? In 1936, I just want to share a little background of the Brahma Kumaris because that's what connects me to my understanding of Bharat. In 1936, Dada Lekraj, a Sindhi diamond merchant in Hyderabad, Sindh, which was at that time in India, now in Pakistan, he received visions from the Supreme Power, Nirakar Paramatma God, and the first vision that he received of the world going through a turmoil, a turmoil of mental health issues, a turmoil of probably wars over religion. Those were all visions that he received. The second vision that he had was of a very beautiful world, a perfect world, where purity, divinity, prosperity would be a natural way of being. And the third vision that he received was of God, the energy, the point of light. And post these three visions, God was using him as a medium to share the gyan, the knowledge of self-transformation, which is going to lead to world transformation. And in that knowledge, the three things that we learn is, first is about who I am, the soul. Second is who is God. And third, most important thing, is the significance of time. What times are we going through? And in that, what we understand is, like it's morning, afternoon, evening and night, a 24-hour cycle every day, then we have a spring, summer, autumn, winter, again a cycle that's repeating. Now there's a slightly bigger cycle, which is a world cycle. So it's the morning, afternoon, evening and night of the world cycle, which we call as Satyuk, Treta Yuk, Dwapar Yuk and Kalyuk. And no guesses in which yug we are right now. Yeah? So we are in Kalyuk. So what is the meaning of these four yugs? Satyuk, when soul power is at its highest, which means the soul is fully charged, purity. That is the yug where every soul is a divine soul and has the power to only give, doesn't need anything. Those souls are called deities, Devi Devtas. Devi Devta means the one who gives. And even today when we worship them, then we have the hands like this of the Devi Devtas, the one who only gives. Every soul at that time would be a Devi Devta because every soul is charged, so they will only give, they need nothing. 
and then the same souls come to Treta Yuga and come to Dwapar Yuga, come to Kal Yuga and in the meantime more souls from the soul world keep coming onto the planet and population always increases. Important is the current time. So Satyuk, Treta Yuga, Dwapar Yuga, Kal Yuga and after Kal Yuga. Now after Kal Yuga. So morning, afternoon, evening, night and then after that again morning. Spring, summer, autumn, winter and then again spring. So Satyuk, Treta Yuga, Dwapar Yuga, Kal Yuga and so after that Satyuk. So that's where it's very important. Okay, now is the time for Satyuk to begin. Satyuk means the golden era. So it's golden age, silver age, copper age, iron age and now golden age again. So when we understand that Gyan, the culture of the Devi Devtas, the Sabhyata, the Sanskar of the Devi Devtas is from Bharat. Bharat is the land of Devi Devtas. So Bharat, not in what we see India in the map today. Bharat is not just what is India today in the map. Bharat is a bigger. The whole Southeast Asian, that subcontinent, that is Bharat of Satyuk. And so why Bharat is called as Jagat Guru? Because Bharat is the Sanskriti of the deities. And now Bharat is to become that once again. Once again. And so even today, the world looks towards Bharat for its spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom. Okay. So as far as it comes to the world outside, the science and technology, we're looking at other parts of the world. But when it comes to the world inside, then we're looking towards Bharat. Okay, that's a, a wonderful way of looking at um, everything. Now me being a technologist, I'm really interested in the moments of change. Mm -hmm. The, the, the pivotal points and yes. we pay attention to sandhyas and to tides coming in right. and going out and so you've alluded to this uh, approaching transformation into satyag. So traveling the world, um, are there obstacles that you have come across and identified that in order for satyag to be heralded in, these are particular changes that need to be made and if so, um, where do we do, do this work. How many of us contributed towards creating the Kalyug? Oh yes, absolutely. It was wonderful. How many contributed towards creating the Kalyug? We contributed towards creating Kalyug. And how did we create Kalyug? Using Kalyugi sanskars. And which are the Kalyugi sanskars? Ego, lust, anger, greed. So each time I am using a sanskar of ego, lust, anger, greed, jealousy, I'm strengthening Kali Yuga. Now each time we are using a sanskar of purity, divinity, compassion, respect, unity. A sanskar where we are giving, we don't want anything from people. A sanskar of unconditional acceptance and unconditional respect at that time we are using Satyugi Sanskar. So there is absolutely no obstacle in creating Satyug. It's only a personal responsibility. Each one of us sitting here today, if we make a personal commitment that I am going to start using Satyugi Sanskars in my every karma, in which means the way I think, speak, behave, I'm using a Satyogi Sanskar, then we are contributing towards creating a world. In Hindi, it's a very beautiful word. Sanskar, which means nature. Sansar, means world. Our Sanskars create our Sansar. Now we are looking at the world today and we are saying the world needs to change. But who's going to change the world? It's not the politicians. It's not the religious heads, it's not the scientists, it's not any one particular community which can change the world. It's our sanskar which will change the sansar. So all that we need is a certain amount of people ready to create the change. And that will be that tipping point where this fixed number of people can overpower the vibration of the rest of the world. Okay, um, speaking as a person from a um, <coughs> Punjabi tradition, and um, 
a desire to engage, shall we say, in a more robust fashion on occasion. Yes. Um, within the Brahma Kumari tradition, do you have particular teachings for people from particular inclinations and backgrounds? So in the um, traditional Vedic uh, teachings, you identify a kshatriya, for example, and they're taught to fight, and uh, a Brahmin aptitude is taught to be wisdom-oriented. So in your parampara, do you have a segregation or an identification that in the bigger whole, this person should be taught this aspect so they can be a better um, participant in, in, in this churn that's happening? Or is it one shoe fits all? Absolutely one. Uh, irrespective of which nationality, religion, caste, faith, gender, age, profession, each one is a soul. Each one is a soul. We see 10, 15 year old children being very profound with their wisdom and the understanding more than what probably I would be at the age of 45, 50 because it's not about the age of the body it's about the soul who's been on the journey so that child who's in a body of 15 today just 15 years back was in a body of 100 and has studied a lot so when it comes to Gyan and meditation and self-transformation there's no barrier everyone is same it's the soul which is learning and it's the soul which is going through a process of transformation so all the gyan that we receive and the meditation we're all in one class sitting and studying all together our chief of the Brahma Kumaris presently is Dadi Jan Kichi who's lived in London for over 40 years in fact, in 1971, she was the one who left India and came to London to start the first Brahma Kumari Center outside India. And from India, she traveled all over the world and today we have centers in 130 countries. And she's at the age of 103. And a student who walks in tomorrow to learn meditation for the first time, they both will sit in the same class and study. Now that's interesting, very interesting, because it's a bit of a departure from the classical way of teaching in our traditions, isn't it? In, um, in a more colourful way, um, myself and some of our um, British practitioners, we've been battling against a group desirous of taking over yoga, of, re of translating it, representing it, packaging it, in what we felt was a diminished form. Now in the olden times, they perhaps wouldn't be taught the teachings because they didn't have adhikar. Mm. So in your tradition, do you have any notion of adhikar or are you happy to give mindfulness disciplines to whoever comes? Everyone who comes has the right to study the same knowledge. How much they use it and implement it is going to be their responsibility. But it is shared with everyone absolutely the same way and everyone is free to share what they have understood and what they have experienced with everyone else. So if I only look at myself, when we started this TV program Awakening with Brahma Kumaris, physical age, that means age of my body was just about 35 and I had been with the Brahma Kumaris only for about 10 or 12 years at that time. And there were so many sisters who had been with the Brahma Kumaris for over 80 years. And yet I was on television sharing the Gyan. So the Adhikar is equal for everybody. Hmm. It's the same. It was nothing to do with how old are you or how much you've been studying or how long you have been here. Whatever you've learned, go and share with the world. When people come to Mount Abu, the headquarter or any center, and a brother goes to pick them up from the station or the mm -hmm, airport, mm -hmm. And while they're driving to the center, the brother driving the car shares the gyan with them. And then they go to the dining hall to have a cup of tea and the brother serving the tea shares the gyan with them. And so they say, how can everyone here share the same thing? Because everyone studies together and shares the same thing. The role is different in terms of the seva. So somebody could be driving a car, somebody could be cooking, somebody could be a carpenter, but in terms of the gyan, Everyone's sharing the same gyan. I'd like to explore this a little bit more. Sure. So the Gita starts with Dharma Kshetra Kurukshetra. Yes. 
And what you're suggesting to me is that there is a possibility for it just to be dharma kshetra, dharma kshetra. That the gurus can be talked out of being gurus and made into dharmic beings. Um, I'm struggling with that concept. That, uh, that an equal sharing, open-hearted and um, without constraint and without prejudgment is a, a good way forward in Kalyug. It, if, if I take it to a national scale, India used to have a massive land mass, it had a vast economy, um, and we had this desire to openly share without judgment. Um, and at uh, this moment in time, we're coming hopefully to the conclusion of a period of a great deal of suffering for Bharat, for the people of that nation. Um, and yet what you're suggesting is that we should continue in that same vein of being open and non-judgmental and just sharing. Um, I'm is that, is that we relevant? We should continue. I'm just sharing that that's how we do it that's at the Brahma Kumaris. You, you okay. <laughs> and right. it's been uh, since 1937, and I think the model worked well. Okay, wonderful. Can I? It's turn? everything is an experiment, isn't it? You experiment and you experience. If the result works out well for you, it's working. So mm. it's just that the model worked out well. Okay, well, that's wonderful. So um, we don't need adhikar. Um, and it, dharma kshetra, dharma kshetra is entirely possible, dharma which is a, a very positive um, aspiration. When we say dharma kshetra, so oh. when we understand the word dharma, mm -hmm. so dharma is religion, religion of the soul. What is the religion of the soul? Like this water, what's the dharma of water? The dharma of water is to nurture people. That's the dharma, it's mm -hmm. the duty, it's the quality of water. So what's the dharma of every soul? The dharma of every soul is to radiate peace, compassion, respect to everyone, irrespective of who they are and what they've done to me. This is my dharma. Today what is happening is we behave differently with different people depending on how they have behaved with us. Today our mind, our thoughts, feelings and emotions get affected by situations and people. So we shift from our dharma when we come to karma. So what we've done is we dedicate, uh, let's say 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour every day to dharma. And then the rest of the day is our karma. So when we are in that 30 or 60 minutes, we're talking about peace, compassion, forgiveness. When we are coming to our 23 hours of karma, we are saying stress is normal, anger is normal, fear is normal, competition is normal. Because we kept dharma and karma separately. To create satyuga again, all that we have to do is make our every karma based on our dharma. Which means use our religion, religion of the soul in our every thought, word, behavior, whether I'm a student, whether I'm a housewife, whether I'm a professional, whether I'm a business person, let me use my dharma in my every karma. So dharma and karma have to go together. Satyuk Treta mm -hmm. Yuga means dharma and karma were together. Dwapar Yuga, dharma and karma separated. If you see the pictures of the deities, you will see two crowns. One is the ruling crown and behind that is the white light, that is the crown of purity. The same soul, the same individual has the ruling crown and the crown of purity, dharma and karma together. Come to Dwapar Yuga, the ruler will have the ruling crown and the crown of purity will be on the prophets. So dharma and karma separated. The ruling was by one person, the religion was managed by another person. Dharma and karma got separated. When we come to Kali Yuga, karma also lost its power and now dharma okay. is also losing its power. So when dharma and karma both start losing power, then the world starts shaking up. And all that we need now is to get dharma aligned back with every karma. We can't do Dan punya in the morning for one hour and then when we come to work we are shouting at somebody we are cheating someone we are exploiting someone and then we are saying oh this is business this is business to business mein to ye chalta hai thoda bahut karna padta hai this is business it's normal no 
then it's Kaliyuk. So whatever I learn in the morning in my understanding of Dharma, I need to translate it into my Karma. So Kurukshetra is not outside, Kurukshetra is just here inside. My inner world of my attachment to my own old ways of thinking. So I need to fight my own old ways of thinking, challenge my own old belief systems which said this way of living is normal and then win over that with the power of one. So Kurukshetra had 100 on one side mm. and 5 on the other side. The 100 had everything, wealth, resources, army and the 5 only had God. And when Duryodhan was given a choice, do you want the army or do you want God? Duryodhan chose the army because he thought of what use is God, he is not allowed to fight the war. So what's he going to do in the war? So he didn't choose God, he chose the army. Same for us today, we need to see what we are choosing throughout the day. We are rather choosing to just only work, achieve, earn. And if somebody says, just take out 30 minutes, meditate in the morning, we say we don't have time of what use is the meditation. So now we only need to decide, are we going to stand on the side of the hundred, which is making Kalyuk stronger, or we're going to stand on the side of five, connected to God and win over our own vices. The fight is not with an individual. God okay. would never teach us to go to war with relatives. But God is teaching us to go to war with our own old belief systems and negativities and win over that to create Satyuk. Okay. I'll, I'll move on a little. Um, you've used the word God on a number of occasions and you've used one of the core scriptures of Sanatana Dharma, the Bhagavad Gita, to place it in context. How does your tradition conceptualize divinity? Divinity? Mm -hmm. Divinity is when the soul is complete, pure, divine, mm -hmm. divine. For the deities, when we speak about the deities, we say Sola Kala Sampoon, mm -hmm. Sampoon Nirvikari, Maryada Purshottam, which means the soul is 16 celestial degrees complete. You know, it's like the moon. When the moon is a full moon and then gradually the moon wanes and then it's a just a very, very thin line. The present time that we're going through, it's a very thin line left. But we are going to go back to that 16 degree celestial complete. Sola Kala Sampoon. And that is divinity. And divinity means when we would want nothing. Kaliyug is a yug where there are never ending desires. Today, we say never ending desires. Ichai khatam ni hoti. Never ending desires. And Satyug is Icha Matram Avidya which means we will have no knowledge of what is a desire. Pata hi hoga ki desire kya hoti hai. So when the soul is depleted, I want more. When the soul is full, I want nothing. So this is the period to shift from never-ending desires to not knowing what is a desire. I think that was so skillfully deflected. I'm going to try and bring you back to this conceptualization of divinity. As a, as a teacher, and those of us here who are teachers, we know that the capacity to give is often dictated by the capacity of the person to receive. And it's very difficult to give something that a person is not yet quite prepared to be able to receive. And one of those um, issues is this notion that, well, divinity, um, outside of myself, is there such a thing as divinity? And in many traditions, they conceptualize it and communicate it in different ways. So we have Murti Puja, where we symbolize certain attributes of divinity in the hope that somebody will then be able to say, okay, this plus this plus this might equal something divine outside of myself that I can aspire to. What is it that you teach people to aspire to in terms of a divinity outside of yourself that you can connect with? Is there such a thing in your tradition? When it comes to power to give, like you shared, it depends on the other person's power to receive. Gee. What all can we give to people? What all can we give to people? One is we can give something physical to people, right? So we donate, there's charity, it's physical. Second way of giving is by sharing. So one is karmana seva, where we are giving something to what we are doing. Second is vani ki seva, through what we speak. But the most powerful way of giving, seva, 
is through Mansa Seva. Just by being who we are, we are giving our vibrations to people. We are giving our vibrations to people. The person there does not need to want it, does not need to ask for it, but they are going to get it automatically. So if we are sitting here and if we are creating stress or anxiety, we are radiating that out into the world. If we are shifting our own self, which means if we are shifting our energy field from that lower frequency to our higher frequency, every shift that we create in ourself, it's benefiting the world. You're radiating your vibrations to the world and that's the biggest saver. And you can give. And everybody else is going to get influenced by that giving without they even knowing about it. So we're giving. But we want nothing in return. Only then it's seva. If there's okay. any element of a desire in return, any, even if it's just simple acknowledgement, then it's not giving, actually seeking in a very subtle manner. Okay. I'm trying to dig a little deeper into those attributes and characteristics which are unique in your articulation of a path towards uh, satyog. So you've used a number of examples from Sanatani scriptures um, and Rajyog is the path. Um, and so do you have a scripture which is particular in terms of its affinity for your own teachings? And if so, does it differ at all to the thousands of scriptures that we have in Sanatana Dharma? Like I shared earlier, when the founder, Tada Lake Raj, received the trans messages from the Supreme Being, all the jnana that was shared was what God was giving through him. And that was all written down and it's called Murli. And that happened from 1936 to 1969, till Brahma Baba was in that costume. Even today, we study the same Murli. So from the headquarters, that's Mount Abu, the same versions are sent all over the world to all the centers and we study only that Murli, uh, which is called the Ishwarya Mahavakya, means God's versions spoken mm -hmm. through Brahma Baba is sent to all the centers and we all study that daily. So the sister of the center will read that out to everybody every morning. Okay, so am I right then in understanding that the, the philosophy is that if Manomaya Kosh if the mental body and the emotional body can be made tranquil to such a degree, then revelation occurs, then communication occurs. Are you replicating Babaji's steps to become capable of receiving directly or are you following his instructions? No, we are studying the Gyan and in our meditation, each one would have their own personal relationship with God. Each one. What is meditation? Meditation is a personal connection with God. So everyone's experience of their connection and their relationship with God is very, very personal. Nobody is trying to compare with each other or trying to duplicate the other person's experience. It's like a parent and a child. One parent, five children. Each child will have a very different experience and a different relationship with the parent. Similarly, God and soul is a very personal relationship. So in terms of relationships, everyone is different in their relationship. In terms of the Gyan, then we are studying only the Murli, which is the Gyan which was given through Brahma Baba. Okay. Uh, again, you've used the word God. And yes. a lo uh, much is lost in translation, so I'm trying to get as clear a picture yeah. of behind your eyes okay. what God looks and feels like. In the Mudli, yes. what's the word that is used for divinity? For God? Mm -hmm. Baba. Baba means father. Okay. Baba means father. So we don't address or refer to him as God, we just call him Baba. Baba means father. So she shifts from just God as some very distant concept to a very personal relationship between a parent and a child. Okay, that helps me. And my apologies to everybody else if uh, that wasn't really a journey you wanted to take, but I, I know some people did want to take that particular journey. Thank you, that helps enormously. Um, so, bringing the Jagat Guru, Guru back into, into the frame, you've sort of indicated that the transition from Kalyug to Satyug is a natural process, like night 
um, being followed by day. And if it's such a natural process, what is our obligation in participating, being catalysts for that happening? Do we have agency in your tradition or...? Each one of us is playing a very important role. Mm -hmm. And which means throughout the day, let's do it just for one day. Let's experiment it as a 24-hour experiment. Today, 5 o'clock to tomorrow, 5 o'clock. 24 hours. Just use Satyogi Sanskars. Just use Satyogi Sanskars. Think Satyogi. Speak the Satyogi way. Behave the Satyogi way. Eat Satyogi food. Drink. Sleep. Wake up. Everything the Satyogi style. And we've already created our Satyog. Would we know what is Satyogi Sanskar? What would be Satyogi Sanskar? Unconditional. Okay. Unconditional. Unconditional acceptance. Unconditional love. Unconditional purity. Just use it for 24 hours and you'll experience that bliss. That bliss. And that one whole day was Satyog for us. And then when we start making it not a once in a while experience, but a more permanent experience, then we've shifted our sanskars. We've shifted. It's not just I was peaceful for one day. It shifts to I am peaceful always. It's not that I eat sattvic food few days in the year, but we're having high energy sattvic food throughout the year because what we eat and what we drink has a very powerful role on the state of mind of people. Very, very, very powerful role on the mind of people. We are what we eat. Jaisa an, vesa man. The food directly influences our mind and so does water. So if we take care that our thoughts, words, behaviors, diet, what we drink is high vibration purity, one whole day, we will experience what it will feel like to reach that Satyogi stage. Then the second day and the third day and then soon make Satyogi sanskars your natural way of being and then each one of us contributing to create Satyog. And when you do it, the ripple effect will be on everybody around you. When we change, don't we influence a change in people around us? And then the vibrations will radiate into the world. So we are making a very big contribution, each one of us. So what went wrong in Satyog? What went wrong in Satyug? Mm -hmm. Nothing went wrong in Satyug. If it's Satyug. so straightforward, yeah, then why did all of those lovely, gentle um, souls at that time, uh, who were completely Satya-based in their existence, what happens to catapult the next yug, the decline It that doesn't follows? happen. It happens very, very, very gradually. When a soul takes a body, in Satyog, the first soul which takes a body in Satyog, the soul is very clear, I am a soul, this is my body. Today, most of us believe I am this, we've forgotten I am a soul, this is my body. I am a soul is only something we study when we meet like this once in a while. Throughout the day, I am a pure soul is something which is completely forgotten. So from Satyog to Kalyog, the journey is about having the awareness, I am a soul, this is my body reached a stage where we are so attached to the body that we've forgotten that I am a soul. So we shifted from 100% soul consciousness to 100% ego consciousness. It's a gradual journey. Like, suppose you're wearing a ring. When you wear it the first time, you remember that you're wearing a ring. You're wearing a watch. So the first time you wear it, you'll have an awareness that I'm wearing a watch. After a few days, after a few days, I don't have an awareness that I'm wearing a watch. That becomes a part of me. Similarly, when the soul takes the body, the soul is aware, I'm a soul, this is my body. This is my body. Birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, morning, afternoon. Half the cycle, we still divine souls, Satyuk, Tretayuk. But after that half cycle, gradually what is happening, the soul is getting attached to the body that it's wearing and starts believing I am this body. And then it's the first trace, the first trace, ego, lust, satyuk, treta yuk, no lust. Ego, lust, anger, greed, jealousy. Not as what we understand it today, but the first trace of ego, lust, anger, greed, jealousy. And when we start 
experiencing those vices, we start experiencing pain, we start looking for God. And so from Dwapar Yuga, it is the time of the prophets, the saints, our scriptures, everything is from Dwapar Yuga because we started looking for it because we had started experiencing pain. So it's the journey of the soul, journey of the soul, but very, very gradual. Lovely. Now, I'm struck by what you're saying as operating on the level of identity and intellect, that a confusion appears at some point in time, there is a catalyst which contributes towards it, and then purifying and educating the identity will take you to where it goes. In some yoga traditions, though, they focus on the fact that a human being is a phenomenon rather than an object, mm. and that there is a flow at play here, and that much of what defines what we are is subconscious. Mm. And in those traditions, they teach that the subconscious cannot be approached directly through mind, it has to be approached through other forms of sadhana. Is that the understanding that your tradition has, that the intellect and the identity is sufficient to transform that? When you're using the mind and the intellect the right way, then we are tapping the third energy, which is the subconscious, which is the sanskar. Mm -hmm. A mind creates thoughts, intellect decides, let's say for example, somebody is offered a cigarette. The mind will get, create two thoughts. Should I smoke? Should I not smoke? Benefits, dangers, risks. Intellect will choose and take a decision. Second time, again options. Should I? Should I not? Third time, again options. Should I? Should I not? After five or ten times, no more options. No more options. So the mind doesn't create options. The intellect doesn't take a decision. It has now gone as a sanskar, that is the subconscious. And when something becomes our sanskar, the stage of options and decisions is over. We just do it. We just do it. Today we don't think, should I get angry or should I not get angry? We just create anger because it's become our sanskar, that is subconscious. When it's thoughts, it has, it's at the conscious level. Once we've got into the automatic way of living, it's become a sanskar. Think of the first time you were driving a car. First time you were driving a car. Conscious attention, this is what I have to do. Was any of us eating while driving? No. Listening to the radio while driving? No. Chatting with people? No. Having breakfast? No. Talking on the phone? Not at all. After 20 days, we are no more driving the car. It's the sanskar which is driving the car and before we know it, we reach home without even seeing the way. That's when it's no more on the conscious, it's gone into the subconscious. That's the sanskar. And today we can chat, we can listen to the radio, we can have our sandwich, we can do everything while driving a car. So who's driving the car? Because we are doing everything else. So who's driving the car? It's the sanskar which is driving the car. So when something becomes a sanskar, we don't need the mind and intellect anymore. The sanskar does it, which we call habit, nature. So with Raj Yoga, the first thing that we work on is our thoughts, purifying the thoughts strengthening the intellect and when these two are done the sanskar will change so the final aim of raj yoga is transformation of sanskar so that's the subconscious changing of thoughts will not be enough ever it's the changing of sanskar which will then change the sansar okay well thank you for expanding on that um, so we have manomaya kosh the mental body we also have Vigyan Maya Kosh, the wisdom body as they call it, and then we have Anmaya Kosh, the physical body. And from what you have said, I've understood that ahimsa or an act of violence can occur on each of those. So when you imbibe a lie, that's into your intellect, an act of violence has occurred at the intellectual level, so you try and repair that. And I can understand how that works on the, the intellectual and on the other Koshas. When it comes to the physical dimension and ahimsa in regard to the physical dimension, what does your teaching guide us to understand in terms of facing violence on a physical level? Facing violence on mm -hmm. a physical level. Yeah. Protect yourself, protect yourself, but definitely not follow the same path. 
that's obvious because if we don't indulge in violence on a thought level on a word level then violence in a physical level that's the last stage yeah. right mm -hmm. so physical level is an easier level it's a behavioral level second level is the verbal level and third level is the thought level so in behaviors if i hurt somebody easy to finish then with my words if i hit somebody mm -hmm. second level easier to finish mm -hmm. the most subtle level is am i creating any such thought which is a negative vibration for somebody else because it's going to reach them and hit them. Mm -hmm. So the subtle checking is at our thought level. Is there any violence happening at the thought level? Isiliya for the Devi Devta, as it is said, ahinsa paramodharam, which means their religion is of non-violence. A religion of non-violence is not about physical, mm. but a religion of non-violence mm. here. That's, that's wonderful, that's really reassuring because no, uh, as my understanding of the teachings, no other creature can behave in an adharmic manner. Every other life form knows how to respond on a moment by moment basis. Mm -hmm. But we have the capacity to be potentially confused so that we don't respond at the level that is appropriate. And sometimes uh, an accusation is leveled against us that we handcuff ourselves with this thing called a pious ego and in pursuit of an idea we stumble and perhaps don't respond in a manner that we should do. So that, that's really reassuring. I'm absolutely delighted to hear somebody say that at a level of physical violence, then one is authorized to respond in protection of one's own survival and existence. I will make use of that to great effect. Thank you for that. Uh, Sister Shivaniji, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to spend a bit of time with you. I know that the work you're doing has a global vision and that you're reaching out to places more and more where Adharm seems to have taken root and bringing a message to them. Being a person on that level, we know how valuable your time is, and for you to have taken an hour to spend it with our Festival of Bharat here in London is, is something we truly appreciate. So on behalf of the Festival of London organizers and indeed the audience gathered here, I'd just like to offer you everybody's uh, gratitude and thank you so much for spending time, and may your journey be even more successful than it has been to date. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.